Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What an honor to have you here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Inhale a peaceful breeze. Mm -hmm. Then exhale the love. Mm -hmm. Calm. Yep. This is a sentence out of a lyrics you wrote for Alex Sipirjin's music. Mm -hmm. Please explain your statement. <laughs> well, it's for me, music and singing is it's it's super active adrenaline hyper boostful but at the same time for me it's pure relaxation and even though and it's for example for vocal technique it's like you have so much activity going on here to control everything but this is pure relaxed and then if you have that control you can just bring the sound and give your story so it's like it's a constant flow of energy and breathing and for me that's music is like love it's like sharing something that you love to do so it's like you inhale joy in a say you could say peaceful and then just with the exhale you spread your your love for music and the stories and so that's uh, where it comes from. Okay, well, you're born and raised in Friesland, yep. which is a very small countryside in the northwest part of the Netherlands, yeah. very close to the sea. And Friesland is very special because still we can find and discover a whole different language there, mm -hmm. which is not just a slang or a dialect. No. Well, for me, this language is very difficult to understand. How do you feel today with these very strong roots in your life? How is your connection today with these roots in you? And do you did or felt like living in an, on an island or in a different country, in a different, different uh, than the rest of the world? And how did you get out? Okay, many questions, many questions. Um, well, actually, the more I got older and wiser, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> um, I actually started to appreciate my roots more and more and the Frisian language. And I started to appreciate more and more the sounds and actually that it's quite awesome that as such a small culture or a group of province in a country you still have your own language um, like when I was younger I actually didn't like it so much because I thought it was not cool because <laughs> people made fun of Frisians still do but now I'm just like <laughs> I'm awesome <laughs> in that sense um, and especially because I started during my masters uh, look into the Frisian language and the sounds and words and looked up if I could find music. Unfortunately, there is no traditional Frisian music in general, Dutch people, so we don't really have traditional, typical folk music, but the sounds and the language are very lyrical and I discovered that it's actually very singable. And since it's my second mother tongue, actually also it brings out colors and sounds that you have naturally in your voice, that everybody that sings in their own language uh, will discover so for me actually i started to grow into it and also composed a whole series of songs in frisian and um, so i probably will use it more and more and then there was the question i think how i got out of friesland <laughs> well it's like you spread your wings and you fly away um well it's I'm a curious person, I would say. I like to discover stuff and I like to look around and learn from other cultures and people. And in a way, by coincidence, I ended up at the conservatory like several years ago. But let's skip that long story how that happened. But I was at the conservatory and there it's such a multicultural pool of people, cultures, musicians, and 
that gives many opportunities actually to see a lot of the world if you are open towards meeting other people or uh, also you have to be active yourself actually for networking and making the contacts and, and but doing that you can really look outside I think and I, I just find it super interesting and now I'm still out of Friesland. But I do regular, regularly, Jesus. <laughs> what a word, regularly. Um, uh, go there to visit. What is that all? <laughs> can, can you say something in freeze and please uh, translate it? Sure, English. I mean, I can do the, the, the famous Frisian sentence that we have. It's, uh, it goes, um, Boeter bree en grien het sies, waar dat net sisseken is geen op rechte Fries. And that means butter bread and green cheese, who can say that is not a real Frisian. Wow, thank you. You're welcome. Well, in your present career as a singer, uh, especially as a jazz singer and a composer and an educator, mm -hmm. uh, languages are a strong part of your being. Well, we have Frise, we have Dutch, English, French, mm -hmm. Russian, yeah. some Korean maybe, I, I, some I, Brazilian I, Portuguese <laughs> maybe. Well, there are some limits. I mean, the. Spanish, Portuguese, Italian side I never discovered yet in learning. Though I have to say Portuguese is a beautiful language. Just if I hear it and the sounds, I'm like, ooh, ooh, nice. But somehow I didn't yet find the time to actually dig into that. But indeed, Dutch, of course, but I never really sang seriously in Dutch. But Frisian, yes. French, yes. English, yes. I started to add Russian to it. Um, also because I figured that Frisian and Russian, the sounds really go well together, which is still something to explore more. But I composed my first song also writing in Russian. Um, and what else? Yeah, it's many, but for me, I, it's, maybe it's a lot of different languages, but for me it's also just sounds. And for me it's always important what sounds good. Like you can also sing a whole song with a lot of storytelling without any using any words, but just having the right emotions and expression and the right sounds on the melody, because words and melody need to go hand in hand. And also what the story is of the words or of the no words of the melody. Because you can do a lot of random sounds, but one sound might not sound as good as the other, it's, it's exploring and if you find this right combination, then it really enhances each other. Yeah, well, in a way this, this is somehow the second part of the next question. <laughs> <laughs> because languages uh, have many different aspects in how to sing a story and in how to be. Mm -hmm. uh, how is this language universe working? with and for you? Well, it's like a, a field to keep on exploring, I guess. And, and to dig into, and to especially I started to be more and more aware of what sounds and words to put on melodies and to also, sometimes if I need to write lyrics for a song or I'm searching for words uh, and sounds for a song, I sometimes I just first play the piano like basic or if I have a recording and then just sing the melody with fake words just made up sounds words just to do and then record it and see what comes out naturally on those notes like what sounds it would need then I reflect on it go back to it listen check it and I'm like oh I like this or I'm like nah, let's try this sound and then just explore and then if I find the right sounds on the melody, see what words fit with it, and then just try to figure out can I make a, a story or a, a combination of words that actually make sense, that it's not just random words, although sometimes in those cases that can also be interesting, but it's exploring and then depending on what language you use, that's, that will be the words you find for it, but I love that puzzle.
Yeah. Super well, interesting. And composing lyrics and music in different languages it's a, and also singing. Uh, do you discover different kind of feelings also when you yeah. switch from one language to the, yes, to the def same, definitely. to the next one? Yeah, it re it's, you would say like, what does it matter? But somehow, especially when I sing in Frisian, I feel more vulnerable. Probably because it's so close to uh, your nature, to your roots. And that's really weird. Even though most people don't even understand it, somehow I feel like way more... Um, what's that word? Um, Self-aware? I don't know if that's the right word that I'm ser searching for, but... At least I, no I, I noticed I feel more vulnerable. But also it made me go through those emotions that it brings up and then you feel like actually it opened up, it made me open up more in general to emotions and dare to dig deeper into the emotional spectrum of storytelling and also allowing to go through those emotions to really experience how the, do these emotions feel so you can um, uh, call them up or something <laughs> and play with them if you sing a song in whatever language but because you understand the emotion you can apply it in the words and if you explore with it and also practice and go through those things you know how to set the boundaries and always keep control you can keep playing it but if you use the right emotions with the right body language you can oof, get, get this extra layer in it. yeah well i have two singers for you uh, the one is edith piaf mm -hmm. and the other one is johnny mitchell mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell me about them a little bit, what they mean for you and is there maybe a, a connection between two of, between them for you? Oui, that's a good question. Well, I think both Eli Piaf and Johnny Mitchell really have this storytelling aspect. Like they're both not the most amazing technical singers, but they have their own sound and their own way of performing, which interests me. Like I am a nitwit and like a super bull in technique because I love to explore and figure out how the stuff works. But at the same time, you also need to learn how to play with that and let go and have, have the leash, let's say if you would have a horse and you have the, the leash, like you have the control, but you can play with it. And for me, especially those two women, they really have the storytelling aspect that I love. And also the melodies and, for example, Joni Mitchell, what she, this, the lyrics she wrote and the compositions, it's like, what? So yeah, so in that way, they, I discovered them for sure on completely different moments and would never in the first place think like, oh, they're so similar. But if I now think of it and you bring like, Actually, it's like, ish. maybe that's also why I somehow <laughs> got interested in both. Like, it triggers, because I really love storytelling. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, with, with the Russian and American trumpet player and educator Alex Sipiagin, you play and work together uh, since a while mm -hmm. uh, and you are connected with him since your study at the Prince Klaus Conservatorium here in Groningen. Yeah. Uh, you recorded with him I think three uh, LPs uh, or albums uh, called New Pass. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you tell me what is new about this new path uh, especially for you? Well I think what makes it interesting or new or fresh in a way is that it's very instrumental music but then the voice is added so it's like I sing uh, horn lines so the music is not composed with the idea there's gonna be a singer no it's composed for instruments for horns or other instruments and we discovered that uh, I could sing those melodies and then he was like hmm, what if we put words on it and I was like <laughs> okay, let's try. But then I discovered that's also how I got really into words, 
uh, lyric writing because I was like, ooh, his puzzle is interesting to figure out. And then if you figure out how to put words on those crazy melodies and actually that it makes sense still, that if you just read the lyrics, it's still a story. And um, then if you perform it also, it doesn't sound like super complicated music. Of it, If you don't have a trained ear, for sure it will be like, why would you listen to this? Because it's not it's not easy listening music. It, it is some complicated modern um, jazz stuff. But I think also it makes it uh, how you say to Hancock in it English. Hmm. <laughs> Inviting. Um, maybe that's the word. I think the fact that there's vocals on this music makes it more inviting for an audience, in a sense. And the fact that there are words uh, gives the, his music a whole different color, because he also plays this music uh, with other projects or other settings. And it sounds completely different. But I think that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. Do, do you also have freedom uh, in this setting with Alex? Uh, can you give him uh, lyrics uh, you want? I mean, um, basically, yes. It's like if I write lyrics for him, um, I always ask him for the story, let's say. Like, why did he compose the song? What's the music about? What, um, what he would like? He's really into the having more like uh, abstract type of lyrics. So using metaphors and not like, oh, I love you, you love me. So, and actually I like that too, to use metaphors and play with words and because one word can express so many things um, but then because I have to sing it um, I somehow always put a little bit of myself in the lyrics too so I use his big line of story because that's usually what I get I just get like Bleh. and that's what I work with and then I put it in such a way that I can refer it somehow to myself because I will be the one performing it and then I send it to him and then I get feedback and usually that's how the lyrics come to life because it's a product for him so he needs to like it, approve with it, even though I have to sing it, I deliver for him. Um, but yeah, and melody wise in a way because the music is very composed and arranged, like to really phrase completely different um, is not really possible so much here and there when it's sort of a, really a feature of the vocals and there's not other instruments playing I have a bit more freedom how to phrase but otherwise I need to blend with all the other instruments so I cannot just do my own stuff but here and there I get the opportunity to say like oh you can improvise or it's collective improvisation or depending on it but also I really love this crazy melodies and you just have to find to sing it perfectly correct in a way, but still put emotions to it and blend with the trumpet or the flugelhorn and so yeah. What are you singing about? What are the lyrics about? What are the stories you are telling? Ooh, depends. A lot is about, for example, the struggles as a musician. Um, traveling, irregularities. Um, Um, meeting people um, or yeah but for example as that's from New Path 1 the first album like for example Videlis that song and if you hear the lyrics the first people always first think that it's towards God like Father da -da 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 -da. but actually I composed it because it's about that you can sometimes drown in in, in insecurities, especially in the music world, because it's like a business based on rejection. You could say you have more no's than yes. And you have to, you have to be, you have to really be able to stand on your feet and to deal with every time like, okay, hey, let's try again. And sometimes you can then just feel like you're drowning and all the work and the effort you put into it. And sometimes it seems like nothing is happening. But then, 
for example, in my case, my dad always can just like I know I can he can pull me boop up. So that's like uh, I need your help because I cannot see, and that's like so referable to I think many musicians is that you you, have, you work so hard and you struggle and sometimes nothing comes out for your sense and then eventually if you just like can just ha oh. and for me that's in that case my dad is the rock in the brown thing <laughs> <laughs> okay well with with Alex you toured also already a lot mm -hmm. uh, you traveled a lot to Asia Uh, for example, you visited and performed on the Taijing uh, Jazz Festival, which was really a huge festival. Yeah. Can you tell me uh, how it was for you to perform there on that festival? That was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I just, for me in general, all those tours in the beginning, like, I just just graduated and then it was like, yeah, Russia. Ooh, Italy, ooh, Asia, and it was like this mayhem of emotions and excitement and feeling honored and blessed that I could do it, like, what? And see these cultures and play there, and I remember, like, you saw, like, this is a big field, Not many people fit here, and then the moment you get on stage and you see this sea of people, and it's like, what? And then afterwards, it's like you're put on a table behind it and then to sell or sign CDs. And then there's just, they put a line for people and they come and pictures and this. And for me, there was like, why me? <laughs> you don't know me. But it's, it, yeah, no, it's, it's awesome to experience that. I learned so much from all these tours. Just on seeing how it is to be on the road, how to deal with the stress and the irregularities, the because it's not like vacations. Like it seems all like uh, woohoo, awesome, and it is, but it's a lot of hard work, a lot of waiting, a lot of just bus, hotel, stage, and back, and um, but you always get some of the culture, and if you're lucky, you can do a little bit of sightseeing. But uh, yeah, I learned a lot and also just to be patient and to just follow, listen, observe and with that grow. Do you have a nice story, a nice memory oh, to yeah. share? Well, af just one. afterwards, actually, I laughed so hard when I figured this out because there's always people that um, film, you know, in festivals like audience members and there's one video of a live performance and I was curious how it looked so I looked it up and then I was like oh this is they started with an instrumental so I'm not yet there but then afterwards they call me on stage and then you see this camera like go like and then I walk up and you're like ooh <laughs> these Asian people and then you hear like this bro and I, I have no clue what they're saying but just to see it to hear that I was yeah I laughed so hard okay Well, when I ask you about a very beautiful melody, what comes up in you, what kind of melody it is, can you please hum or whisper this melody now? Um, yep, that's possible. But you make a sound with your own typical sound, that one that always was there in you, have always been there in you. Mm -hmm. How do you learn to discover your own voice and discover more possibilities, more growth? Ooh, I think that's maybe one of those things that's like a never-ending process and like to your own sound, it's like, 
Woof, that's the hardest part, I think, like to know and to figure out what is your sound and what fits best. And for me, it was just explore and try. And like with technique, you can create a lot of control and try out a lot of stuff and expand and make the voice stronger and create a color palette that's like one voice that you don't hear the breaks, that it's just you can use everything and then try it. What if I put my mouth like this? Or what if I put my tongue like this? Or what if I put the airflow like this? And then you keep discovering. Like recently I discovered like how I could sort of, if I use the mic in a specific way and the air in the mouth stand and stuff, then um, how to sound sort of like a flute, like a the dwarf flute or a pan flute sort of like combination of this. Or you can use it as a color for improvisation or as an intro or so that's like you keep exploring and sound wise I just tried also a lot of different styles in music songs like I did reggae ska stuff we did the modern I still the, the modern jazz pop soul funk a lot of stuff to figure out like wh when do I feel the most honest or the most real or what feels best or sounds best color wise and I think I slowly start to discover what fits me but I still if people would ask me what well, what is your sound I would be like I don't know <laughs> I do know but I cannot put it into words I think not yet let's say it like that okay well can you tell me then how you create melodies Ooh. Are they maybe waiting for you somewhere and you Who just knows? pick them up? Who knows? Who knows? It's like, it's inspiration, it's... And sometimes, a lot of times I... I don't know, they just appear. They just pop up. And then you're like, who? And then, or I sit, go to the piano or I write it down or I just record it. A lot of times I know just record it so I really don't forget. Um, and sometimes I just go for fun to the piano and sit down and then something comes out, you just improvise a lot and then melodies can pop up or come out. Um, and of course you can use theory and, and, and etc. to find melodies or make, create melodies. But for me, a lot of times composing wise, I don't know, something just pops up and you start playing with it. and. Maybe in the end, the first melody completely disappeared, what it started with, but it made it flow or grow into a creation. So yeah, I think that's how my melodies sort of come to life. Good. With Ivan Barishnikov, the young Russian uh, saxophone <laughs> player, uh, he studied with you at the Prince Klaus Conservatorium uh, during the master program. Yeah. You played and recorded in New York his album Journey. Mm -hmm. um, and you s were singing with your own lyrics uh, a song called Go On. Yeah. Um, how did your work started with him and how did you compose the work with him? Um, well, I mean, we got the first time I remember I, um, it was I think like uh, one of the first days of the school, the conservatory, and you meet people and you're in the in the hall and then it was like, hey Hiske, how are you? And I was like, who are you? <laughs> like in a way it's a familiar face, but it's like I see so many faces, so I was like, um, please fresh my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, yeah, I, uh, you signed my LP. And I was like, I did? It's like, yeah, you were, you remember in this club, like blah, 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 and with the new path. And I bought the LP of uh, New Path One that was like, I guess it was September 2014 or something like this. And so I signed his LP and then I was like, wow. I said, what are you doing here? Well, I'm going to study the masters. Like, well, me too. And then. That's how um, it started and we figured out that we're on the same uh, wavelength, like you can, uh, uh, you 
like each other as as, as let's say mm. just on a social personal level but also music level you can understand each other and then you start sometimes you play together or you get to play because of ensembles during studying and then at some point he asked me like if I was interested in uh, joining his project for his album and that he I said also if, would you like lyrics I'm not, I think I mentioned it or he asked it I don't remember Correctly. I think I said to him, like, also, if you like, I can write words. Because I think he asked if I could just sing the melody without words. But then I said, like, oh, if you would like words, I can give it a shot. And then he was like, ooh. I think I was on the table of uh, Diederik Irma. I was taking care of their cats in the house. <laughs> I think that was when the conversation was was happening. So that's how it started, and actually it, it's my process, how I also work with Cipriaki, and I ask like, what's the story behind this song? And do you want me to follow it, or just make up something myself? But I followed his story and tried to find the right words, and then I sent it to him, and then get feedback, and then back and forward, and with that uh, it came alive. So he wrote the melody? He wrote the melody, he had All the, the song. Music. He wrote, he composed all the, the music and then I put the words to the melody and sang it. How long did it take for you to put all together to get a really a satisfaction from that? Mm. I don't know. Actually it was quite quick, but it's like usually for me the real lyrics, the writing part can go sometimes like this. Like very fast and then I have a first draft and then back and forward and then if you put all the time together actually it was pretty quick but there's a whole thought process listening process that goes up front like I get it and I start to listen and it starts to brew but then how how many hours that I don't know it's it's a flow and it's a, you prepare and then I make notes I make lists of words that can go with uh, the topic. It's almost like you make a spin, but not literally. I just have lists of words or a little idea or a phrase. I'm like, ooh, maybe this word can go on that melody note. So I make a lot of notes and then it's just a big blur of a lot. And then so there comes this moment that I'm like, and then it starts. And then it's just like, mm. and then before I know it, it's like, there it is. Yeah, it's a very positive, a very uplifting song, I have to say. Yeah. And the melody really stays for long uh, when you listen to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that song. Yeah. For these beautiful lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also performed in New York during uh, your master program, uh, which is part of the study program New York Comes to Groningen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that one uh, is initiated through Joris Tepe. Uh, he is the head of the uh, Groningen Jazz Department. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you learned uh, there in New York? Uh, and from whom? Uh, who did you meet there? And how was it there for you to be there? I, I think you were there uh, six months? Yeah, sort of. I was there a bit shorter. And in between I was also again in Russia. <laughs> I went up and down. Um, well, I I was there or I had been there already two times before. Like 2012 was during the bachelor, like you have this New York trip that you go for a week. And then, let's say going from I think 2015 to 2016, sort of like there, I also was like several weeks in New York and in between going to Brazil up and down. Um, so I already knew a bit my way around there or how it is and knew some people also through Alex again because you get contacts so that helped a lot um, so I also start try to stay in touch with those people th throughout and also make them aware like I'm gonna be around and so I met up with those ones and so many concerts you meet a lot of people um, and I studied with David Bergman and with Misha Tsiganov, mostly for arranging and composing. Um, and with Becca Stevens, also for, because I really love her songwriting and her stories. And I was curious how 
she could help me in my, even though it was in Frisian, everything that I brought, like if I, if you hear the music that I composed with the sounds of the lyrics that you don't understand, what do I transfer to you? So I would just show her or let her listen stuff. And then she would tell me like, what is it about? And then I would be like, that's actually quite great. Or I would think like, okay, I need to work on this. And actually for me, that was a super interesting process to actually work like that and really focus on like, I want to know this and I'm gonna find this person. And so I did a lot of sessions with Misha Tsiganov because of his way of arranging really worked for me at least for then and I really he gave me really good tips and ideas on how to work and also because he worked with folk music and since I used Russian traditional vocal melodies in my music I was like let's find some interesting things there so I did that a lot and lyric writing and aside from that I just learned a lot about also just about myself I guess how it is because I always really wanted to go to New York and just be there and live there and then when I finally was there I was like I don't think I want to be here <laughs> I mean I love I would love to go back and visit and get this boost of amazing musical pool that you can dive into but for me to live I was like I guess I it's not my place so that was actually also interesting to discover and also discover like, yeah, this, yeah, I think that was a big, big discovery actually that I in a way probably didn't expect. <laughs> but that was also interesting because it helped me also to write and compose the music that I had to compose or was working on for my masters to put those stories and connect other things in life to that, to the experience and use the experience there also as sort of a fruitful pool for words and expression. Was there something specific uh, you remember? What was uh, uplifting or downlifting you? Uh, did you have uh, very special uh, good experiences there, but, but maybe also ma maybe bad experiences there that you want to share now? Uh, well, the good thing is that you can just see so many great concerts and musicians and meet so many and everything is so close to each other, especially if you go to Manhattan. Like all these clubs and bars are very close, but then the downside is if you really want to enjoy everything, <laughs> you need the money. And that's the thing, like, we students and people, we're not super rich and already living there is, like, so expensive. And, and the food and just living in general there is very expensive, so you need to take really good care, like, okay, this is this, and then I have this amount of money, and then I can go and see these concerts, so you need to be very selective in what you do. And then sometimes if you, f you cannot always go everywhere, and then you're just somewhere in, in New York, or at some point I was in... In somewhere in New Jersey, in in a room which was sort of a room but not completely with walls, it was like something with a curtain, sort of. So you don't you have privacy but not fully, and you pay so much for this, not shitty room but not so much privacy, so you cannot make so much noise, and so then to figure out how can I practice, how can I do because I I'm like I want to practice and. Uh, and work and so figuring out and then sometimes you need to rent places or rent studios to actually work or practice but that costs money too so that's like okay what is priority what do I do so, yeah how did you get out of that just by playing <laughs> <laughs> fly back and you also performed there yeah yes and which settings and uh, how did you find the people there um, well some was just with students from the conservatory too, that people ask each other, like, or you get to join. And since I knew some musicians through Alex Sipiagin there, I also contacted them if they were willing to join me in uh, organizing my own concert. And actually also Ivan Barishnikov joined that concert. So, because I was like, I, I don't want to take it the easy way and go to the typical places where most students play because you can easily get a gig. I was like, let me try to get a gig in a place which is not that obvious or easy to get and also here and there I just 
created the balls and just asked you know, more known musicians, can I sit in? <laughs> can I join you? I mean, I knew them, but I was like, yeah, let me just ask. And sometimes it was possible, sometimes not. But that way I was like, I can give myself some exposure, not in the typical student setting, but more for other audience. And actually doing that gave me the gig in this other place because the wom there was a woman and she organized those gigs. So it was like contact, contact via via. And that's how I got it. Okay. Did your voice change the last years? I think so. I mean, I don't... It just developed more, I would say. And it keeps on developing. And since also when you get older, your body changes slowly, goldly, inside. <laughs> and... Yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't know, in, it's not like in extremes, so it's the same if you look every day in the mirror, you don't see yourself change so much, but then when you see old pictures, like now you have this thing like 2009, 2019, like the 10 year difference, and then actually if you look then, you observe it from a different aspect again, and then you can see actually the whole change that happened, but in a way I was like, ah, I didn't change so much. And I think that's the same for my process in the voice. I know that I developed and grew and have more options and um, made all the registers stronger again and using sounds and creating quality or how to apply stuff better. But the real, the big picture, I don't know, because it goes so gradually. I know I developed and changed and grew, but I couldn't say like, well, there's a little boom, boom, boom. Okay. But can you maybe tell me how you feel while you sing, uh, maybe while you perform uh, during a concert? Uh, can you discover feelings or are you just focused on uh, no, what you have I, to do? No, I mean, for that, I what I discovered that I grew in is that I dare to be more and more myself on stage like because you have this idea when you start like okay this is how a performer should be and this is how you should behave and this is how you have to look and your face should be like this and then i was like i'm just i'm not like that i need to do once in a while or or, or if i want to take off my shoes i take off my shoes or if i do a little dance i do a little dance you know like and i discovered this actually in russia that I was like, yeah, part of my words, like, fuck it, this is who I am. I cannot hold these standards any longer. <laughs> because there was like, the Russian audience actually is quite similar to Frisian audiences. That was another discovery that I did. It's like, you see them and it's just like very serious and they don't show so much emotion. And there was this concert and I was like, people, please relax. You know, like, you don't have to all the time you can I don't know and I wanted to I felt there was some kind of wall and I tried to stay and get to reach them and I just was failing and at some point I just couldn't find the words anymore so I stood here I was like Bleh. like I just couldn't I just had to let it out and then everybody started laughing and from that moment the ice was broken and I started started to see people start to relax and then I was like okay I can just be my goofy self and just or I can just be super serious and whatever but I also have my weirdness so I I decided whatever if that comes out it comes out and not everybody will like it but some people will I think if you are very honest and open and yourself on stage it reflects to people and they see it and they don't see something that you pretend to be like something so they probably appreciate it more and actually it's nice, it feels like relieving or like refreshing, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, this is like, so yeah, so that's, I think, uh, and it helps also then in how to perform because you're more honest, you don't have stuff that you try to control because of rules or settings, it's like, no, this is just who I am, and then you can really focus on the storytelling and the interpretation and the music and just be there and not care about, oh, do I have another chin, or do I, <laughs> or whatever, just, 
Yeah, I mean sometimes then of course because it's moments and pictures and stuff. Sometimes you see them. Like, <laughs> it's like oh dear lord, but that's just life. Can you tell me how you deal with wrong notes? Does this happen sometimes? Oh, of course, I'm human. <laughs> <laughs> of course, and it's okay. I mean, I do am in a way a perfectionist, but I start to be more um, balanced perfectionist. I don't know if that's the right, correct way of saying, but let's say I don't punish myself anymore so much as before. You punish yourself? <laughs> no, just that if you make a mistake, you're like, oh shit. <laughs> but now it's just like, it happens. It's, it's more, and everybody has that. And perfect, what's perfect? And maybe this wrong note actually was not wrong. And that's also part of improvisation. You try stuff, you hear stuff, and sometimes we, especially as vocalists, you cannot press anything. So sometimes just you think you had something and it goes somewhere else. But in general, I can say I'm quite accurate when singing melodies. And I know, because I know where to place it in my face, because that's how I practice it. I know like there has to go. I, I look from it from a technical perspective. And then when I have put it everywhere in, the spectrum where I want to have it, then I can just trust it and beep, and then just focus on a performance. But of course, it's it's a moment, so stuff happens, and of course sometimes you're a bit bummed because you're like, eh, that went wrong. <laughs> but I mean, then it's like, of course you can hang in or hang in that failure, or you can just say, oh, next time better. Yeah, you also teach singing. Uh, you work do work out for beginners, uh, uh, you teach vocal techniques and you teach storytelling. Mm -hmm. Please explain what you do. Well, I love teaching. I really love teaching. Especially uh, vocals or master classes or stuff with vocals or expression. Um, I knew that I liked it, but I always thought I would be more of a performer and I really wanted to tour with all the world and do that. And now I discovered actually, that's also something I discovered in New York, how much I love teaching. Because I couldn't really teach there and I was like, I miss it. I have to do this. You I missed need... something. Yeah. Okay. For me to, I have to, if I only teach, I would probably get depressed because I don't perform. If I only perform, I probably will get depressed because I don't teach. So I need to do both because I really love to perform and play with amazing people that you can have a click with and create something beautiful. But at the same time, this craft of the voice and the technique, I find it super interesting. And then to help other people find it in their own bodies and find ways how to make them sound the best or just help them for relaxation because for some it's just for fun. and. Uh, it helps them express, or um, it's it's such a beautiful. It's well, I can <laughs> I like that. that, that, that. It's uh, I really love it a lot. So it's and I for, I don't have one method of teaching, because every voice is different, every person is different. So I can of course I learned from methods and figuring out like, but if I explain something technical or something about storytelling or emotion uh, there's not just one way of doing that because I can't say well pull that muscle and you're good no <laughs> unfortunately it doesn't work like that so it's about figuring out the student and finding their needs and then figure out like how they can um, explore this craft and, and it's yeah, I love it. <laughs> but is there something uh, that you teach uh, in situations like storytelling? Mm -hmm. What do you uh, tell people how to? Well, it's about do it's, that? it's it's sort of part of acting because as you that's like musician as an actor. I followed this class also, sort of a minor you could say, and it's about exploring your body and posture and. What do you do with your hands? What do the eyes do? And what if your posture is like this? Or just doing like, okay, do like you walk on stage, 
and take a bow and do it in such way that we really feel the need to applaud. Like all this stuff, or how do you stand, or if you... Um, a lot of times people don't know what to do with their hands. But just stand, for example, you just have to stand with your hands next to your body and just say the words. And then you start to notice, like, where does it feel the need to move? Instead of, I will do this because this is what it's meant. It's not like that. It should come naturally. And also, a lot of times with storytelling, I let them just speak the words. Not like, let go of the melody. Here is the lyrics. What is it about? How does it refer to yourself? Or what, in what context do you put it? Uh, to who are you saying this? Is it to yourself? Is it to a person? Is it from another person's perspective? And then just speak it with meaning and try out different um, ways. Like, what, does, what feels right? What if you go up? What if you go down? What if you say it loud? What if you say it soft? All this stuff, explore. And not following the melody, because sometimes you, if you would speak the words, the phrases go differently than if you just say it how it is written on the melody. And then when you put them back on the melody, a lot of times you start phrasing slightly differently or be more free, still following the melody, but it comes out more natural than just these are the words on the melody. Do you also focus, uh, do you have problems sometimes with, with your voice uh, uh, that you can't sing uh, like you wish or like you need to and how do you overcome them? Well, of course that happens. I mean, people get sick once in a while. <laughs> I mean, in general, like to have a cold or whatever, you can sing almost always. I just, for me, the moment it's like when I don't sing is when just the voice really disappears because you really are sick, really. Like just a general cold, you can sing because that's why you have technique. Then you can really um, make it almost sound like you don't have a cold or if you know how to place it, how to use it, or if you do sound a bit more, just use it to your uh, advantage and play with the sounds. And But technique is really a big part that makes helps me in situations that I'm super tired, that I can trust, that I can still deliver quality. Maybe I have to work a bit harder or it's not completely as uh, how I would usually sound when not being as tired, but at least I know I can always deliver. There's a beautiful song, uh, Sting wrote, How Fragile We Are. Ah, yeah. How fragile are you? Woof! I guess quite fragile. <laughs> I'm super strong, I figured. And that's also partly because of doing karate. And I still have uh, many things to sensei Mark for busting my ass. <laughs> And just make me mentally really strong and find respect towards others. And not that I didn't have it, but in a dojo, you just have to pay respect and you follow the senpai or sensei. And you get physically strong and self defense, but also mentally. You make me really strong and help me a lot actually in music and being able to deal with some stuff or handle stuff and know like I can go through this. Of course, it touches you because I'm a very emotional person, but still. So yeah, in a way, I'm very fragile and emotional, and I am breakable, but I know that I'm also very strong. Frisian power. <laughs> well, singing is also sharing, mm -hmm. and singing is working together and exchanging. Uh, you started a beautiful uh, project in Russia also uh, called Stereo Base. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me a little bit how you got together and how you discovered that you can share something together? Uh, well, I got to know all these musicians through Alexey Byagin and going to Russia. And then we discovered that after concerts or meeting people that we actually also are on a, just on a social level, we connect really well. And we became friends and staying in touch. And then in the beginning, I just, every time when I would see them was if I would be there with CP again and maybe play with some of the musicians. But then after a while, we were like, if we enjoy playing so much together and we just enjoy each other's company and we like each other's qualities and are curious to what we could, why not do something together? And then I was like, sure, 
And then before, like two months later, I guess I was again in Russia and we <laughs> did concerts with my music. But then in the beginning it was like, yeah, but she plays bass and he plays bass. Who to pick? It's not fair. Like this. <laughs> and then we were like, let's just do both. Why not? And then we figured out the way I brought in the music. And then together with Makar Novikov, we started to, he's, he thought about how to put the two bass players or in it, like when to use maybe electric or two acoustic bass. And then also because he, f at some point he had a cello, we, we were like, well, maybe I can do something with cello. And now he plays also cello. And we started to combine all these options together and arrange my music for the setting. And that's also how I started now. Uh, or during the masters compose my newest music like for that setting in mind like oh I can use these colors these varieties and let's say we we use this disadvantage of let's say or no it was not a disadvantage but let's say we felt like eh we don't want to choose even though we have too much bass players like just use it and figure out a way and how to create and then actually I think something very interesting came out and we're super good friends also so it's like also on stage we just have so much fun and we can you know what to expect from each other you can depend on each other you can trust each other so and that makes it a super comfortable uh, place to work together and we can also be very critical to each other and serious and yeah. What What do you like about uh, Russian people, Russian musicians especially? I mean, are they different than Dutch people? I mean, for sure they are different than Dutch people, but because it's a different culture. But musicians, I guess, m musicians is just a di different species. <laughs> okay, with some musicians you might click, with some not, and it's everywhere the same. But. For me, the musicians that I got to know are all super open-minded and uh, they're also eager to learn and to explore and to um, be creative and make something beautiful. And I'm lucky and fortunate that I can play with some of the best musicians in Russia. But also the other musicians that I got to meet there are like curious and open-minded and the people also, if you just see general Maybe Russian people, you think like, why aren't they smiling? Why is everything so serious and like, Bleh. but then it's like the moment you get in their homes or they get to know you and they like you, they open up and it's like this warm place where you get into. But I think also Frisians can be like that. They can also be a bit like, mm. <laughs> and then you you get in the family and it's a warm bath. So. There's similarities and there's difference, but that's also because of culture and it's everywhere. What is for you the most beautiful sound you ever experienced? And it can be anything. Mm. Don't explode. <laughs> wow, I don't know. I really don't know. Because there are so many, so many interesting sounds and moments and... I mean, the one that pops maybe the most in my brain like now is because I, I remember that uh, that's from the French music, Au Suivant, this song. Because for me it was like this awesome song and like oh, so much emotion and power and... And I remember in the beginning I couldn't sing it. I mean I could sing it, but not this super powerful, high intensity, like still have the control, don't don't let's say ruin your voice because you're always screaming. So I needed to figure out how to technically do that and practice that. But then and then when that's in control and that's set, then you can add the emotion and the storytelling to it. And I remember when I could really sing that and perform that and really feel this emotion and stuff and you see that you transfer it to the audience because the audience is like and you feel also like this and there's this tension going on and then the relax and people also can relax again but i remember that was like an awesome moment but yeah i had several moments like this or 
sounds, but that's the one that pops now in my brain. Yeah. Very short, uh, can you tell me who you are when there is no music around? We. My life is quite music. Do we have some uh, <laughs> oh, I love crazy sport. hobbies, maybe? Well, I love sports. I really love sports. And since recently also do I try to see what are the connections between sports and music. And recently I really discovered that it's actually it's very parallel. Also, I started this because vocal singing it's controlling muscles with the technique so and with sports it's also muscles and building and i figured if you use the right technique you have the best results and if you combine it with the right nutrition of course it helps and it helps in your work field in music and the control so if you have your technique right and you use it right you will get the best quality and the best sound and that's the same for sports and if you're healthy, it helps you in your music and your capabilities. So for me, that's, of course, then again, we are at music, but for me, that was interesting to discover. And But I also really love sports. I might even, if I would not have gone into music or theater, anything like this, probably maybe do something with sports. So that's one of them. I really like stand-up comedy, to watch it. I really like it from the right people. Like, I don't like all stand-up comedy, but some. I can really like, I really love hiking in the mountains. It's been a while. It's one of those things like, ooh. And, oh, I, I did, um, how you call this, uh, paragliding? So to fly? Oh, that was like, that. I think there was one, like, for me it's so difficult to shut up my brain. Because there's always stuff going on, thoughts, words, music, sounds, stuff you need to do. But I remember the moment I was in the air, hanging on this parachute with this super nice old man. Like He's like the best of the best um, things. And um, he, when I, we were flying in the air, I was like, this is peaceful. And my brain shut up. <laughs> was silent and you just fly and I was like wow this I want to do more thank you very much and good luck with all your projects Thank and you. with your voice